are gonna clear up, put on a happy face. Brush off the clouds and cheer up, you put on it. a happy face. Take off the gloomy mask of tragedy, yeah. it's not your style. You'll look so good that you'll be glad you decided to smile. Pick out a pleasant outlook, okay. stick out that noble chin. You know Wipe it. off the full of doubt look, slap on a happy grin. <laughs> and spread <laughs> sunshine all over the place. And put on a happy face. Take it. Put on a happy face. Stiff up a little. Uh-huh. Just put on a happy face. And if you're feeling cross and bitterish, don't sit and whine. Think of banana splits and licorice, and you'll be fine. I know a girl so gloomy, she never laughs or sings. She wouldn't listen to me. Now a she's like a mean that. old thing. So spread sunshine all over the place and put on a happy, happy, happy face. I love your face. I love your face too, baby. I love your face more. Even though it is the very tail end of March, today is March 30th, I have already planted out several things in the garden. Tomatoes, peppers, um, what else? A few herbs, a few flowers, lots of flower seeds. I did that yesterday and the day before, and I'm doing it again today as well. Um, and vegetable seeds, because we're supposed to have a 70% chance of rain tomorrow, so. Why not use the rain to water the seeds? Because remember, you not plant transplants where the roots might be down there where it's already wicking. So obviously, when you plant seeds, you have to water from the top. So I thought I would show you real quickly again, even though I've done a ton of videos on this, uh, how I'm doing it this year. Now last year, at planting time, I had amended the mix with several things, and I showed you that in a video. It was C90, it was uh, a bit of gypsum, uh, worm castings, and a sustain, 464. And I think that's all. And I mixed it in just the top few inches of the soil. I'm not doing that this year because I already did it in my new mix. If you watched my previous video on how we are reusing second year mix, I went ahead and mixed all those things in to the new batch of mix so I don't have to do that. The only thing that I have to add or will add is my mycorrhizae, which is the brand I buy is foundation and I get it from Boogie Brew. Now, two plants I've got an eggplant here, which in my potato video, I told you I was probably going to plant either an eggplant or some beans or something like that right by my uh, potato plants. The eggplant is actually a trap crop for the potato beetle, and beans, like bush beans, are, uh, they deter the potato beetle. Well, guess what? I'm going to have eggplant here and my a roll of bush beans right here close by. And as you can see, my potatoes are already starting to come up, which is always fun. So, I've got my little hole here. Eggplant, typically, I always stake it until it gets pretty big and sturdy. You know, we can get some high winds, so I stake it. Now, with a transplant this size, and yes, this year I bought a lot of plants because I, I just ran out of time to do a whole lot of seed starting. So I did buy transplants from a very reputable local guy. So if you're local folks, shop the potting shed. He's gonna need y'all's big support right now. I don't even know if he's been able to be open this week. I haven't heard 
but I got these things before he um, everything had to shut down in the state of Alabama. With a transplant this size, you want to put um, a half to, to a, up to a teaspoon of your mycorrhizae in the bottom of your planting hole. Now, if you have one of those little six packs of small stuff, only use about a quarter teaspoon. And when you're doing seeds, you don't use mycorrhizae when you're planting your seeds. I'll talk about that in just a second when I show you planting the bean seeds. But for now, I've gone over many, many times the benefits of mycorrhizae. And you want it down there as close to the roots as possible, which is why we're putting the product in the, in the planting hole. This is Black Beauty. I've grown those before from seed. We don't eat eggplant really anymore. I love it. Um, but Randy doesn't too much. And honestly, a lot of times the eggplant doesn't love me. So I stopped planting it last year. This one, like I said, will probably end up being a trap crop. We might get a few off of it. And if we do, I'll fix my favorites. All right, now, ugh, if I can get up. <laughs> Going to gently water it in. I think I got this on full. And gently water it in. I have my steak there. I put my steak in first just so that I don't risk damaging any of the plant's roots. And it needs to get just a wee bit bigger before I actually put my tie from it to the steak. Give it a good drink. Now, I haven't made compost tea yet, but I will be doing that later on in the week. Like I said, we're supposed to get 70% chance of storms tomorrow. So I'll wait and see uh, what the weather's going to do. And uh, probably I'll make the tea in a week. And reason being because around that time, a week to 10 days, is when I'll be coming back and adding a ring of fertilizer <coughs> to all of the plants that I've already planted. And I'll show you that part too. Um, now I'm gonna put my easy straw on top. I do not put easy straw <coughs> on everything. Um, but I do like to put it on eggplants, especially tomatoes. Very, very important to have your tomatoes covered. So let's go over and do the tomatoes now and I'll show you what I got over there. On this first row here, I've got um, all the same thing because they're my favorite of all the tomatoes. And they are an heirloom, uh, Cherokee purple. Um, usually I only plant two, but to tell you the truth, heirloom tomatoes have more of a tendency to get diseases and viruses because they're not a hybrid. You know, they haven't bred into them resistance. And even if something says resistant, it doesn't mean it won't get it. It just means it's less likely to get it. So I've got four Cherokee purples. The two five gallon, these are 14 gallons. The two five gallons, I usually plant companion plants, um, forage, and also um, I add companion plants in my tomato buckets. And some of them have a little bit of basil in them, but I ran out of basil, so I gotta get a little bit more of that. I put one basil in each tomato, uh, bucket and then I usually add something like uh, petunias because that's supposed to help improve the flavor of your tomatoes. So is the basil and sometimes I add like um, a nasturtium or so. So now I'll show you this row. In my middle row here I also have all four of the same kind of tomato plants. I've never grown this kind before. It's called Parks Whopper Hybrid Improved. 
but um, like I said, I got this from a local nursery and shout out to Heath at the potty shed. He had a lot of these and said that he really likes them. So I decided to go ahead and get four of them. In the five gallon buckets, I have peppers. Again, uh, the reason I, I space it out like this and have smaller things in between the peppers instead of having like five totes, I could get, eliminate these five gallons and have five big totes. But this gets really congested and we get plenty of tomatoes with this amount planted. So I plant things that are shorter in nature but still kind of compatible with the tomatoes in between. So this pepper is called a cow horn pepper. It's a hot pepper. I have never grown it either, but he pointed that one out to me and said he loves them and that they're not just terribly hot. So I got one of those. And this is just your standard red bell pepper sweet pepper and I've got my basil planted in front of it. I've talked about easy straw. I don't know. Probably for, I mean, ever since we've had this channel, I've told you about easy straw. Um, and I used it way before that too. I love it. It stays in place. I've done a lot of videos on the fact that it does not breed or attract insects at all. So that's not an issue. Now, this little one here has a bloom on it that I missed. I got all the rest of them. Also on the peppers, when I planted them, I came in, if they had uh, six to eight true sets of leaves already, I came in and I pinched out the center. That's going to make them bushier, branch more, more branches, more pebbles. I only do that one time when they're, like I said, six to eight sets of true leaves. Show you the last row. On this back row, this first uh, one I have is Beef Master. It is a hybrid. All of these are indeterminates. So they should produce for a good four months. This next bucket here is dill that actually overwintered. So I had dill in it before. It must have dropped some seeds because here we have it springing right back up. Now dill is very, very good to plant next to your tomatoes, but not with your tomatoes. Because a young dill plant actually benefits being grown with a tomato, but as it matures, it um, is not good. It's not good for the tomato. It's gonna stunt the tomato's growth. Next to it, great, not with it. But dill deters a lot of pests that tomatoes um, can get that are drawn to tomato plants. Now why the easy straw or any kind of mulch, whatever you use, why is that so important on tomatoes? Again, uh, if you're new, you might not know this. Most of you probably do. Tomatoes are notorious for getting fungal diseases, especially um, blight, septora, things like that. Now, most of the time, or a lot of the time, that can come from the soil. And if your leaves touch the soil, it can get it. If you don't have this covered well and it rains on it, the splash up of the soil onto the leaves, it can get it. So I always cover my tomatoes immediately at planting time. Now, I didn't this time, I waited a day, but that's pretty close. These leaves that are down here that are kind of touching the straw, 
Normally I would take them off, but these plants aren't really very big yet. So I'm gonna let them get a little bit more growth before, before I take off those lower leaves. Those are actually the cotyledon ones way down here anyway. This one, these two are pink brandy wines. They are also an heirloom. So again, because heirlooms have a, a bigger tendency to get problems, I like to plant more than one just in case because I want to be able to have some harvest from them. Love the pink brandy wines. Okay, last up, I'll go over and show you uh, planting my beans and talk to you a little bit about when I will be using the foundation mycorrhizae on those things that I have planted directly by seed. On this next row of five gallon buckets, I also have on each end some cherry type tomatoes. This is a yellow pear on this end. And on the other end is the sweet 100s. We only do two now of the cherry type tomatoes because they just yield so many we can't eat them fast enough. Now I have cucumbers here and the buckets with no straw. I just planted some pole beans which are rattlesnake beans. I'm trying them again. See if I can get them to go this year. I may have had some bad seed but I wanted to find out because I do like the rattlesnake beans. This entire gutter is going to be a striker bush beans. I'm excited to try that variety. Shout out to Peter Baldwin in South Carolina. He's on my group page. Great member, has a fabulous garden. There are several on there that do. And anyway, he grew these striker beans last year and the production he said was absolutely unreal. And looking at the pictures, they were unreal. So I thought I'd try that variety this year. He only planted, I believe, one per five gallon container because they got so huge. So that's what I'm going to be doing. But just in case one does not germinate, I'm putting extras in there. I think I've got enough to put three extra in, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna do two right now because I know I've got that many. Now, the mycorrhizae, once these beans <laughs> pop up, and, and I'll remove one of them and plant it somewhere else, maybe in a raised bed or something. But once they are popping up, then I will use a root branch with the mycorrhizae. I could actually put the mycorrhizae powder in with uh, uh, my compost tea, but the reason I don't do that is because the mycorrhizae is pretty expensive and um, you don't have to use as much if you use it as a root drench. Now, you saw that I had my beans in this little closed container with water. Well, it wasn't just water, it was also hydrogen peroxide. I use two tablespoons of hydrogen peroxide in two cups of warm water, and then I pour it into a little container like this and I soak my seeds. For the bean seeds, I soaked them about four hours. Now, why do I do that? First off, if you've ever gardened and read anything about beans, they do suggest soaking them first. They also suggest putting an inoculate, a bean inoculate powdered thing in the hole at planting time. I used to do that, <clears throat> but frankly, uh, that stuff's kind of pricey too. And I didn't ever see a real big difference of when I used it and when I didn't. The inoculant is basically just supposed to help scarify, so to speak, the seed coat, the hard seed coat of the bean, so that the embryo uh, can get oxygen faster to grow. 
Well, if you put hydrogen peroxide in your water and soak your seeds, hydrogen peroxide is a chemical scarif scarifier. So it chemically scarifies the seed. In other words, softens it a little bit so that it will break faster and the embryo will come out. So on the root drench, now, I mentioned about the mycorrhizae, um, that I could use it in compost tea, but it's pricey. And if you put it in your compost tea, like for, I don't know, it's like for 50 gallons, you have to use a pound. So if you're just doing five gallons, that'd be 1.6 ounces, I guess, of the mycorrhizae. And the little package I have is only a four ounce package. That would only let me do, you know, maybe three compost teas. I don't want to do it that way. You can make a root drench with the mycorrhizae powder, one tablespoon in a gallon of water, and all you have to do is just keep it agitated and then drench your plant. So catch you next time in about a week when we'll be out in the garden again. Hopefully the weather will cooperate and we'll be planting up a lot more things. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. Have a good one. And keep looking up, folks.